Father, we thank you for your love and your mercies. They're new every day. Help us now to open our hearts and our minds to hear your voice. May we sense the importance of all the details of your plan. Bless us now as we seek to understand, as we really open our minds to you. May we hear your voice now. Guard us and protect us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, I just changed what we were going to do here. <laughs> we'll move a little bit differently today. Last time we talked about prophecy as being God loving us and also warning sinners. I realized this week that the church is doing the spirit of prophecy as a gift. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of interesting that the thing we're doing matches with what the church is doing. We've done that before. So I thought that since the Sabbath School Quarterly is moving in that direction, that we might clarify some terms today. The gift of God, of course, no matter what the gift is, is a gift based on love. Everything he does is based on love. But prophecy is one of the most fantastic things, to me anyhow, that God has done in recent times. God is speaking to the human race again in a very direct way through the prophetic gift. And that hasn't happened for a while. So I thought I might read some statements to clarify what it is about prophecy that makes it so peculiarly adapted to God's people. I want to read something from Councils to Editors and Teachers, page 241, that might help us. It says, in clear terms, the prophet John speaks of the remnant, or the last church, as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. Now, I want to stop right there because I don't know how much you are involved with some of the things that are going on throughout the whole church. But there are people trying to say that the remnant is any Christian in the last days. Well, that's not true. Especially among scholars, there are those trying to say that. But the remnant right here, just in this little statement, says it's the last church. Now, who is the last church? Is it the Baptists? Is it the Nazarenes? Is it the Methodists? Is it the... Well, it can't be all of those. They're all teaching something different. This statement focuses right away on John in Revelation 12, 17. The ones who keep the commandments of God, well, that lets out a whole bunch of people, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to finish the statement now. In another passage, the same writer gives a plain definition of what he means by the testimony of Jesus when on one occasion John attempted to worship the angel who appeared to him in vision, the angel said, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Now, again, there are people who say, Well, brethren means Christian. Well, that's not what it means. Of thy brethren... Of John's brethren, not of your brethren and my brethren, of John's brethren. Who are John's brethren? Let's keep reading here. Under similar circumstances, the same angel said, as recorded in another place, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets. <laughs> 
So now we've got a connection here, a link between the scriptures. See thou do it not. I am, you know, your brethren, worship, with your brethren, worship God. Your brethren are the prophets. So John's brethren, the prophets, have the testimony of Jesus. All right. The thought expressed is the same expressed in both these passages. In one, John's brethren are said to have the testimony of Jesus, and the other, the brethren are called the prophets. Therefore, it is the prophets who have the testimony of Jesus. Now, even Wagner got himself all messed up with this. Wagner wrote and was preaching in his time that every Seventh-day Adventist has the gift of prophecy. And Ellen White says, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's not right. <laughs> that's not true. The gift of prophecy is what prophets have. <laughs> the spirit of prophecy is what the prophets have. Now, we all benefit from it if we believe it, yes. But we do not have the gift of prophecy just because we read the books. <laughs> okay, continuing. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Comparing the Bible expression, the testimony of Jesus, with the statement of Revelation 12, 17, concerning the remnant which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, we conclude that prior to Christ's second coming, his true church will be keeping his commandments and that they will have the spirit of prophecy. So there's the complete statement. Do you really know you belong to God's true church on earth, the last church, and that you are the part of the remnant? How do you know that? Well, here's two ways, very quickly. It's a commandment-keeping church that has the spirit of prophecy. Now, how many churches do you know like that? <laughs> it hit me really hard when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist. That God has only one church on this earth as an organization. He has a church based on people in the different churches. Yes, they're his church too. But they're not part of his organization. He has an organized church that belongs to him that he guides and he leads. Now, we may not follow very well, but he is still the God of the Seventh-day Adventist church. We have something to do in this world. That's why his last church. God never gives the spirit of prophecy to people who don't keep the commandments. It's an impossibility. Commandment keeping and spirit of prophecy goes together. Now, what is the testimony of Jesus? See? We have to be clear on these things. The courts deal with testimonies, don't they? When they ask a person to give their testimony, what are they asking them to do? Well, they're asking them if they were a witness to something. See? And the court accepts what a person knows they saw. Now, lawyers are very apt in knocking a testimony down if they find out the person is not really saying what they see. They're telling us what they thought they saw a few seconds later, and the court will not accept that. The court wants to know, what did you really see? What do you know? What can you prove based on what you saw? And so the testimony of Jesus is Jesus telling us what he knows, what he can prove, <laughs> what is an actual experience. That's the testimony of Jesus. That's what he gives to the prophets to share with the people. Now, let's try a third one. The faith of Jesus. Now, this has thrown people all over the place. What is the faith of Jesus? Even the pioneers had a hard time with it. What does the Bible mean by the faith of Jesus? Well, I'm going to read you one statement. I try to find statements 
that say it so you don't have to have a hundred of them. You can find a hundred, but one good one does it. Five manuscript releases. Page 290. You inquire what the faith of Jesus is. I have seen that the brethren and sisters have not understood the faith of Jesus in his true light. They have taught that it is healing the sick, etc. It is not healing the sick merely, but it is all the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. <laughs> now there are people wandering around saying, well, the faith of Jesus is the faith he gives me. It's his faith. Well, that's partially true, but that's not really what the Bible means by the term, the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the New Testament. Everything Jesus has testified about, his testimony. Now, there's another way the word faith is used. And the reason I'm doing this is because Sometimes we get locked into a, an ultra-conservative way of looking at words, which is not true. And we got that way by listening to tapes. I'm sorry. Because a lot of the people who are out there doing things think in a certain direction to prove their theories instead of staying with the Bible. There is a very important principle we need to, to understand and keep and not lose, and that is that you can't make one word mean the same thing every time. You see? If you want to say, well, I now know what the word faith means because I have this description, you're going to get yourself confused because the word faith can be used different ways. <laughs> now, when... When Jude says to contend for the faith that was once delivered, once and for all delivered to the saints, he is not saying the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is the New Testament, everything in the New Testament. So what is Jude saying? To contend for the faith that was once and all, for all delivered. Well, when did God deliver something to the saints? Not to a saint, to the saints, the people of God. When did he do that? Well, he came down on Mount Sinai. <laughs> yeah, he came down on Mount Sinai and he delivered the faith. You will have only one God. <laughs> you will not worship images. You will... Not do things in vain. You will worship on the seventh day, Sabbath. You will honor your father. And you, that's the faith delivered to the saints once and for all. The commandments of God. And then we have the faith of Jesus. So we have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. The whole Bible in, those, in that one statement. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That's the true church. <laughs> and to me, it's just a fantastic and wonderful thing that God has done to compress it down into one sentence. <laughs> and when I deal with ministers of other churches, I ask them to be candid with me and tell me, who do you know that meets that description <laughs> today? <laughs> You know, when, when uh, Jehovah's Witness, and there are some decent people among the Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's, a, it's still an error. It is not the church of God. It's a sect. But when I deal with some of those people, they start getting a little bit boisterous and rambunctious and saying that they're the real church and the real people and all this. I ask them, Where in the Bible does it talk about the real church so you can identify them? It's oh, Revelation 14. Because they think that's them. They've been told that's them. So I ask them, would you tell me about Revelation 14? Don't tell me about 
Rutherford and all these other people. Don't tell me about your ideas about numbers. I don't want to hear about those. Tell me about Revelation 14. That's what you, you claim is your territory. And I ask them, what about the 144,000? Tell me about them. And they say, oh, they're really holy people. I say, really? They're really holy people. How do you know that? And they give me their reasons. But then I ask them, do the 144,000 take communion? They say, yes, they take communion. Then I ask them the question they were hoping I would not ask them. Have you ever taken communion? No. No. Why not? I'm not one of the 144,000. Well, you have just told me you're not able to deliver the message of Revelation 14 because that is the message of the 144,000. <laughs> so what are you talking about if you're not one of them? <laughs> And they know they have a problem now. But do you know? I ask Baptists the same thing, and Methodists, and Lutherans. Where do they fit in Revelation 14? And they can't answer it. Nobody can answer it. It's not possible. Because there's one question we can ask every group. Are you teaching that we are in the judgment hour right now? Because... That group says the hour of God's judgment has come. It's come. Now, I don't know what all this does for you. But belonging to God's true church means something. <laughs> Not just because you're in the right place, but because somehow God has attracted you and he has pulled you and you have responded and there's a connection not only with, between you and God, but between you and God's people. We're supposed to press together. Unity is the sign of Christianity. And I'm sorry, but there are people out there doing everything to tear up that unity. Yeah, they go around raising fusses, creating suspicion, Judging, I mean, discernment and judging is two different things. I hope you know the difference. <laughs> when we are saying something about the fruit of those kinds of people, we are not judging them. We're judging the fruit, and the fruit is not love. The fruit is self. That's what it is. And who is the one behind self? Yeah, you know who that is. <laughs> the fruit will tell you what's going on. All right, so we have a beginning here. The faith of Jesus, the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus. And we didn't mention Ellen White one time because Ellen White is not the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> okay? Okay. She's the instrument. She's very important. She was faithful to her work. But the testimony of Jesus is Jesus, not Ellen White. Now that to me makes it very, very important. When a person does not want to read these books because they're finding things in there they don't want to know about, they're not rejecting Ellen White. They're doing something very dangerous to their salvation. I'm going to read you another statement to show you how dangerous. Loma Linda Messages, page 33. The law of God and the spirit of prophecy go hand in hand to guide and counsel the church. And whenever the church has recognized this by obeying his law, the spirit of prophecy has been sent to guide her in the way of truth. The dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, had the testimony of Jesus Christ. This prophecy points out clearly that the, the remnant church will acknowledge God in his law and will have the prophetic gift. 
Obedience to the law of God and the spirit of prophecy has always distinguished the true people of God. Now, that's, that little portion of the sentence can be read two ways. When you put an and between clauses, there's two ways you can look at it. One is, there's this, and then there's that. Or there's this and this together. In the Greek, it's called a copulative chi. John does it all the time. My Lord and my God. That's the same thing. See? The and there does not separate. It holds them together. Now, this statement, let's try to understand it. Obedience to the law of God, cut and the spirit of prophecy has always distinguished the true people of God. That's one way to read it. Now I'm going to read it the other way, the way John uses the word and. Obedience to the law of God and the spirit of prophecy. Oh, what? <laughs> Obedience to the spirit of prophecy? Aha! How can a person say they obey the law of God, but they don't obey the spirit of prophecy? How does that work? <laughs> so, the testimony of Jesus is one of the most fantastic things that has happened to the church in modern times. He's talking to his people again. And when he talks to his people, what does he expect in return? Why should God show us things if we're not going to do something with it? Why would he do that? <laughs> That just doesn't make any sense, does it? For a person to be praying for knowledge and accumulating information and ignoring it the whole time. So we're back to our subject of last week. God, our Father, loves us. And he had a real problem when Adam sinned because he couldn't talk to him face to face anymore. Adam was now blind. He couldn't hear. And all he knew was what was right in front of him. No infinity anymore. No, no communication with the rest of God's creation. And so God had to find a way to deal with man. Us. In the sinful condition. And the way that he formulated was to deal with a faithful human, one he could count on to talk to, and they would talk to the rest of the people. The Bible calls them seers at first, and then prophets, nabi. But the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of God dealing with a human, the testimony of Jesus, is God loving first his church and then loving the world through the church to warn the world what's coming. And last time we mentioned that God's people know the future. Okay. Now that's very important because everybody wants to know the future, but God's people know the future. We mentioned Joseph last time. God revealed to him the seven years of plenty and the seven years of drought. And he told Pharaoh, and so they prepared themselves for those seven years where there wasn't going to be anything by saving something from the good years. And so God told them the future for a purpose so they could do something about it. Now, what has God told us about the future? Because God's people always know the future. Why is that? Why do God's people always know the future? <laughs> because God isn't hiding anything from them. He's showing them. <laughs> God doesn't mean to hold back anything. Not from us. If we don't know something, whose fault is it? <laughs> Our ignorance only lands one place. 
We're not putting in the time. We're not putting in the effort. We don't care. I mean, <laughs> because God's doing everything he can to reveal the future to us for a purpose. Thus, so we'll be ready for it, so we can make preparation. And there's only one way you can prepare for something, and it's not waiting until you get there. Yeah. It's today, right now. It's when the preparation counts. Because when the time comes, you'll be ready because now it's second nature. You do what needs to be done because it's you now. Now, we know a lot about the future. I'm not going to go into a bunch of it right now. We have time later to get into some of the real details. But I'd like to show you just briefly how many details God is giving us that we may not be seeing. Let's go back to uh, Exodus 10, 11, and 12. You know what's going on there. The children of Israel are slaves. In Egypt, Abraham told them the future. He said, 400 years before it happened, you're going to go into Egypt. You're going to become servants. You'll end up just being slaves. He said, but you will be there for a certain length of time, and then God will deliver you. Well, some of the people understood that because when the mother of Moses understood it was about that time and the king said, kill the children, the male children, and she had baby Moses, she said, no, not this one. It's about time. She knew the future. She knew God was going to deliver Israel and there would be a deliverer. And she said, <laughs> we've got to save this baby. And so you know the story. Well, when Moses grew up, he turned out to be quite a person. He was highly intelligent. He learned many skills. And the people of Egypt were in awe of this man. How can a man know all these things and be so good at everything? <laughs> yeah, they really appreciated him. And so did Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, he's second in command. <laughs> There's nobody like him anywhere. Well, I'm not going to go through the story. I want to get to chapters 10, 11, and 12, basically. The people knew they were going to be delivered. God had revealed that. So when Moses went to the elders and he says, it's time, the Lord has chosen me to help you in this deliverance. Well, they accepted part of that. They understood it was scriptural and it was okay. But God, because he always wants his people to know, he's in control. And when he talks to them, they can count on what he's saying. He said, you know, I'm going to kill the firstborn of everything that grows out here. And I want you to tell Pharaoh about that. But I want you to know that he's going to resist you when you tell him, let us go. It's time for us to leave so we can worship and be with God. And God said, I'm not only going to deliver you, I'm going to tell Pharaoh what's coming, and he's going to resist you. Now, that's all future. That, those are details. <laughs> okay? And so Moses went, and he talked to Pharaoh, and he said, let us go. And Pharaoh said, no way. No. We can't let you do that. So he resisted. Now, did God kill all the firstborn then? No, he didn't. What, what did he do? Yeah, the, the first plague. Now the children of Israel, when they saw that plague, they knew there's going to be another one because the firstborn didn't die. <laughs> you see what, what knowing the future does? 
It sets your mind so you can see what's happening. So then you know it happened again. He told him, here's another plague on you. Now you don't need to go through this. <laughs> Let us go. <laughs> and Frau was, was saying, well, what do you think you're doing here? Who is this God you're talking about? I don't know him. I don't listen to him. That's like a lot of people, you know. I don't listen to God. I'll listen to my brain. I'll read it in the book and I'll decide whether I want it or not. Well, anyhow, Moses then stood back while the plague came. And God said, I'll tell you what, the plague of the flies won't be where you are. I'm not going to let my people go through that. The plague of the, the plague of the, the and so he told them, they're not going to participate in these last seven plagues. They, it won't bother them. So now they knew the future. Those plagues would not bother them. Well, God's giving them a lot of details because they're his church, his people. Well, we'll leave that for now. Let's go over to Exodus 12. God says to them, this month is going to be the first month of the year for you. In the spring, not January. So they had two calendars. <laughs> One that began with everybody else and their own calendar that began in the spring. Abib or Nisan. And so God said, on the 10th day of this first month, this new first month for you, I want you to set aside a lamb for each household. You set it aside. On the 14th day, you'll sacrifice it. Okay. Over there in John 19, Jesus left Jerusalem on the 10th day of that month and was sacrificed on the 14th day. So he was that lamb, exactly fulfilling the specifications that these first people were told in Israel during the sojourn in Egypt. Okay, so then God said, now you're going to use that blood. I want you to put the blood on the doorpost. And I'm going to come by at midnight. Around midnight. And all the firstborn of every creature is going to die. But when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And it will not happen to you. Now we need to notice something very important there. He didn't say, I'm going to tell you the future and now you're okay. He didn't say that. Now we know the future. Are we okay? Not because we know the future. <laughs> We're going to have to do something about it to get through it. What did they need to do? They needed to put the blood in the right place. We need to put the blood in the right place. Not your head, in your heart. Okay? Now, the details keep coming. God says, now when you, if you have a little family and that lamb is too much for you, or a goat, uh, either one they could use, uh, share it with your neighbor. Get together, divide up the cost, and work it out so your families are together to, to eat this lamb. Now, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. You need to be standing up. Don't sit down to eat this. You stand up. You have your staff in your hand, and you be ready to move. You be fully clothed and prepared to go. Well, don't you think these are a lot of details? <laughs> God was telling him all the things that were in the future for them. All the things. And we're just touching on it. We're not talking about the hyssop. We're not talking about the bowls. We're not talking about, I mean, details. <laughs> God has revealed to us in our time details about our future. And when I say our, I mean your future and your future and your future. God knows all about your life and he knows every detail of your life and he wants to reveal to you your personal future so you don't have any questions. 
That's right. So many times I, I bump into Adventists with that glum look. They say, oh, I hope I make it. I hope I make it. Don't you know what God has set up? You hope you make it. You're not going to make it. Not thinking that way. Don't hope. That's like saying my church believes. My pastor believes. Who cares what your pastor believes? What do you believe? You know, salvation is so personal that God comes right to you directly so that he can communicate with you, but he uses these books. Yeah, yeah. these books are not the Bible, but they come from the same place. That's another mistake people make. They say, well, those books are not important. That's not the word of God. Yes, it is. <laughs> this is the testimony of Jesus. <laughs> I have heard scholars now, you may not have had the misfortune of being around lots of scholars. I almost used a different word. But I have been there. I have been with some scholars. I've talked to some of these people. And they have certain directions they take. And there are certain trends that develop. Desmond Ford was not alone in what he was doing. We have hundreds of men like that, but they're not talking. They believe certain things and they don't believe other things. We have good pastors and we have others who really shouldn't be a pastor. That's a, just a big mix. Now, it's not for us to get out there and fix it up. God takes care of it. <laughs> okay? but, but we need to know that it's happening. Okay? Now, when scholars get together, they come up with interesting questions. I wonder if God made the earth out of nothing or if he made it out of something. Yeah, we, we have symposiums today among our scientists, Seventh-day Adventist scientists, to decide whether or not God made the earth out of something or out of nothing. And they'll spend days and days and days working on this. Now, they've got the same Bible we have. <laughs> it seems to me just a few sentences would clear the whole thing up. <laughs> Hebrews doesn't say he made it out of nothing. <laughs> I mean, that's enough. <laughs> and there are a lot of strange questions that people get into. Another one is, is Ellen White authoritative or is she just pastoral? Yeah, our ministers get running over that one. What well, Desmond Ford decided it for everybody. He said, she is not authoritative. She's only pastoral. Yeah. Do any of you know about Glacier View? The General Conference called a meeting of 120 scholars of this church to decide whether Desmond Ford was right or not. 120 scholars. I think five minutes with a man who knows the Bible should have done it. He wrote a book, about 1,100 pages. He was a prolific writer, that man. Putting down his views very clearly, and he presented it to the 120 scholars to read so they would know what he was saying. Of a poll that I'm aware of, it turns out that only about three of the ministers who received that book, the scholars, read the book. The rest of them didn't have time for it. Now, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. <laughs> I can't make a judgment on it. But it seems to me that if you're going to investigate what somebody's saying, you ought to at least see what he's saying. And then make your decision based on the word of God and your experience. And then get rid of it if it's not from God. But that didn't happen. The decision, unfortunately, was made before the meeting. And that's how they handled it. There are some strange things going on in the name of the testimony of Jesus. So I think we ought to be a little more careful 
when we have all these statements. I want to read one from volume 9 of the Testimonies, page 20. And I'm reminded of something in Desire of Ages. Maybe we'll read that too. 90, page 20. Are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? <laughs> now, this is a problem back in Ellen White's time of people saying, well, we don't know what these prophecies mean. We better wait to see. When they happen, then we'll know. <laughs> yeah. That was going on. James White had a lot to say about this too. But this is, this is the testimony of Jesus. We can read this one. Of what value will our words be then? What good does it do to wait until the Sunday law to tell our neighbor, you know there's going to be a Sunday law? <laughs> They're going to look like that. It's like we're crazy. So, well, I know that. I read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we wait until God's judgment judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Now that one we need to understand. Are we going to wait? That sweet neighbor down the street that says good morning when they go by. How are you doing? Oh, doing fine. Everything's good. I'm... That poor person, if nobody tells them what's coming, is going to go down and be lost forever. That is a lost soul. Perishing in our neighborhood. And you know what? The Bible has told us the future. There's going to be a city with a big, in the English it says a jasper dome. Yaspis in the Greek. Transparent. You can see right through it. The people inside can see the people outside. And can you imagine you're standing there looking at all those terribly Torn up people. And you recognize one and it comes up to the wall, banging on the wall. What are you doing in there? <laughs> Did you know about all this? Well, yeah. Why didn't you tell me? I mean, who, who wants to have that experience? A neighbor banging on the jasper, saying, why didn't you tell me? Well, I wasn't sure how it was going to work out. I wasn't really clear on the timing. I wasn't clear on what it means by these corrupt legislators succumbing to popular opinion and passing a Sunday law. Uh, I mean, how can I tell you about that? I didn't know for sure how it was going to work that everybody who didn't belong to Jesus would become a demon. I didn't know how to, you know, we know a lot of things. <laughs> God has revealed the future to us. And the poor people out there who are not part of the remnant church, they don't know anything. Spirit prophecy says it's going to come on them as an overwhelming surprise. Suddenly. Suddenly. I mean, suddenly means suddenly. You don't get a chance to go over it again. A crisis. It's where you show who you are. It's not when you get ready. Now, Jesus... How much did he know? Now, don't take this for granted because we have people in some high muck-muck places saying 
that he didn't know everything and neither does the father. There are books at the ABC that say that. That to make it fair, God doesn't know everything. How foolish can anybody get? How can he tell us the future if he doesn't know the future? <laughs> I went to school with some of the people that are teaching that. The bright ones, the stars. How horrible. What does Jesus know? <laughs> he knows everything. He knew before Satan apostatized that he was going to do it. He knew man was going to fall before he created the earth. He knows. As a man, through the spirit of prophecy, he knew he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to die. He knew what the high priest was going to do. He knew what Judas was going to do. He knew he was going to fulfill all the prophecies. Psalm 69. It's the last thing he did. He had to finish all the prophecies. There was one left. He said, I thirst, and they brought the vinegar, and then he said, it is finished. What an amazing thing. It is finished. The whole plan has been accomplished now. What did it take to finish it? That little bit of vinegar. <laughs> I've never heard a sermon on that, but it just strikes me how Jesus knew everything. <laughs> Now, if Jesus knows everything, do you think it's worthwhile paying attention to what he's saying? <laughs> Should we doubt anything he says? How come we have to hear it twice? What is that? We have to hear, hear it twice before we'll begin to <laughs> open up to it. The testimony of Jesus is never going to change. Review and Herald, October 22nd, 1903, pointing to some of those present, our instructor said, you are making a mistake. The Word, the Word revealed by God, this is to be the foundation of your faith. Study the commandments of God and the testimony that Jesus has borne to the truth. He is the faithful and true witness. Now we know that. It says that in Revelation, doesn't it? The faithful and true witness. That means he can stand up in any court anywhere and he is unimpeachable. What he says is the truth. Except to me. Oh. Do you see what we're saying about God to the whole universe? Well, he can save the whole world, but he's going to have trouble with me. My sin is something so big, even God's going to have a problem. No. The gift of the testimony of Jesus is something so fantastic. And we're not, we're not paying attention as a people. Do you know there is a possibility, and I hate to say this on a recording, but there is a possibility that God is going to have to wait for this generation to go down to get some people raised that can do it. How can I say that? All the time setters are going to jump down my back and say, no, you can't do that because 120 years from now, uh, oh, we're this many years from, from the two, year 2000, and, and they bring out all their numbers. No, friends. Do you know 
that when Moses turned around for those extra 40 years out there, he thought he was going in right away. But he couldn't go with that generation because that generation was not going. God had to raise a whole new generation. Another 40 years. And my only question in my mind, I don't know these things. This is not something God has revealed to me and I can't find it any place. Is how many times can he do this? Because he can't raise another church. This is the last church of God. This is the one. He has to do it with the Seventh-day Adventist people. There is no Bible for any other scenario. Now, if he's not going to do it with you and me, that's really sad. That's almost too sad to even think about that he has to bypass us and wait to get some people who are willing to listen to him and do what he says. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to get you to wake up. I'm trying to wake up. <laughs> Something's wrong, and it's not God. What is waiting for? What is he waiting for? Christ Object Lessons 69. God is waiting. With intense longing, he's waiting to see his character reproduced in his people. That's what he's waiting for. He's not waiting for us to become experts on the 2300 days. He wants to see Jesus in somebody. He says, when? When that character is perfectly reproduced. Oh, that word, perfectly. She had to put it in there. <laughs> when, when that character is perfect, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is our privilege not only to wait for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord. You know, in the Hebrew, the word hasten, is shakad. We are to become the shakad. Where in the sanctuary was the shakad? The word shakad also means almond tree. The lampstand had buds, blossoms, and blooms of an almond tree. We are to become the light of the world through the Holy Spirit of God. He's waiting for us to become the almond tree, the to hasten. <laughs> now, the Jews should have all known this. We should have known it. <laughs> it's in our books. <laughs> Page 69, Christ Object Lessons. <laughs> now, how many Adventists can give you what that page means. And page after page after page after page is like that. It's God revealing spiritual things to his people so they may know not only the future of the world, but their own future. There's no, I hope I'm saved to this. Salvation is a science. Yeah, it's a science. The devil has his science. Do you know what the devil's science is? I'm getting into some other areas, but we need these, I think. This is part of our defining of words. All of this is in the spirit of prophecy, by the way. It's in the Bible, too. But the spirit of prophecy is so clear. The devil's science is what he did in heaven in front of the angels. This is in the book Education. His science. And almost half of the angels in heaven picked it up with him. 
They didn't understand it at first, and it was too late after they got a hold of it. The science of the devil in heaven was the exaltation of self. Self. I will be like God. I'll make up my own mind what's right and what's wrong. He's not going to tell me. His will doesn't count. I'll decide what I want to do. And when I get other people thinking like me, I'm going to establish myself on the sides of the north. I'm going to have a throne. And people are going to worship me. Because they will be selfish just like me. They'll be devils just like me. And when Adam did it, the devil said, see, <laughs> now the earth belongs to me. I'm the God of this place. Of course, he was wrong. The earth belongs to God. Nobody's going to take it away from him. <laughs> but the devil really thought he did it. And you know, every single human being since that time, by nature, is a friend of the devil. Now, I told that to one of my theologian friends who believes that Adam, after he fell, gave that nature to Jesus, that Jesus is like Adam after the fall. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, if Jesus was like Adam after the fall, was he selfish? He said, oh, no, somehow he didn't sin. I said, what do you mean, somehow? <laughs> what is this? Somehow the nature of Jesus was holy. There's no somehow to that. Then I just told him, your theology is wrong, and I don't care how many of the Seventh-day Adventists believe the same way you do. They're all wrong. This is a very bright man, by the way. And he, he's, a, he's a good man. He does a lot of things right. But I don't know how long he can stay that good man believing that kind of an error. The spirit of prophecy says error cannot sanctify. Only truth can sanctify. The testimony of Jesus. What a fantastic thing we have. Desire of Ages, 398. The substitution of the precepts of men for the commandments of God has not ceased. Even among Christians, are found institutions and usages that have no better foundation than the traditions of the fathers. Such institutions resting upon mere human authority have supplanted those of divine appointment. Men cling to their traditions and revere their customs and cherish hatred against those who seek to show them their error. In this day when we are bidden to call attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, we see the same enmity as was manifested in the days of Christ. Of the remnant people of God, it is written, the dragon was wroth with the woman. But every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. In place of the authority of the so-called fathers of the church, God bids us accept the word of the eternal Father, the Lord of heaven and earth. Here alone is truth unmixed with error. Truth unmixed with error. So what is God's church supposed to be? Unmixed. Yeah. Now, we are not supposed to be theologians. I have never read where we're supposed to be exact in our theological premises. I've never read that. That's not what error is. 
Error is not living like Jesus. That's what error is. The truth is practical. It's the way we live. It's every day. It's all of our thoughts, all of our actions, all of our everything. You know, I read a statement the other day that just jarred me. I thought I've read most of Ellen White's statements, but this one I hadn't seen. <laughs> it was over in some little thing she wrote in Australia. She was talking to ministers, and she was talking about ministers who were using the ministry as a cloak to pollute the people. And she was tough. Oh, and, then, and she said, I'm not saying it too strong <laughs> in the ministry and she was really hitting hard and then she said oh minister you're so holy on God's day what about the rest of the week <coughs> oh <laughs> yeah what about that we're God's people on the Sabbath well what goes on the rest of the week HMS Richards, one day I was talking to him. I had the privilege of, of meeting him and talking with him a few times. What a man he was. He said, you know, I have a neighbor down the street in Los Angeles. He had that little garage where he did the Spirit of Prophecy broadcasts. He said, I have a neighbor down the street, and he never, never called me a Seventh-day Adventist, and he never called the church people, Seventh-day Adventists, he never called them that. Every time he re had reference to them, he called them Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventists. And Richard said, you know, that's a pretty good idea, isn't it? <laughs> that we'd be Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you, when's the last time you were reading the books to hear God's voice talking to you, not to make something for somebody else, to get in there to see what does he want in my life? What does he want me to know? What does he want me to be doing? When's the last time you did that? We need to do it every day. Every day, every day, we need to be baptized every day in his spirit through these words. There are some things in here going to really bite. They're going to do that. There are other things that are going to give you real comfort. There are other things that are just going to lift you way up and say, oh, I'm so glad it was said like that. But whatever, it's all going to be a blessing. This is the testimony of Jesus to your soul. Now, I'm only talking this way about the spirit of prophecy because we have had some ideas circulating that just are not right in our midst. Desmond Ford, like I said, was not the only one. There are people who try to say, she's just pastoral, she's just a counselor, it's not really something you need to incorporate in your life in every area. You take that approach, you're not going to be a Seventh-day Adventist when this ends. It's not going to happen. In volume three of Selected Messages, page 84, she says, one thing is certain. Those people who give up their belief in the spirit of prophecy will stand under the black banner of Satan. That sounds to me like it's very important how we relate to these books. To the author of these books, Jesus himself. Satan. That's not a good place to be. But you know that one thing that he learned in heaven that works with the angels. It works so much easier with humans. I'm going to be my own God. I only listen to my brain. When Adam fell and he became like him, 
He shuddered. Spirit prophecy says the devil shuddered to think he would be like him, like him, that Adam would do that. But then when it happened, the devil said, well, now, we have a situation here. God says, I can't go back. He said, I can never be forgiven. But he's going to find some way to forgive this man. And when he does, I'm getting on board. <laughs> yeah. the, the devil thought he put God in a corner. He's going to save the man. Well, it didn't happen, did it? <laughs> he found a way to save the man that doesn't include the devil because the devil can't get any new information. He saw God face to face. He saw love. He saw mercy. He saw tenderness, gentleness. He saw it all. What new thing is God going to come up with to show him? Can't happen, so that's that. But do you know the devil was so deceived that when God told him he couldn't come back because he would never change now, you know what the devil did? He proved it. He got mad. Yes! He went into a rage and says, you're not fair. You can't do that. I'm going to get you. I'm going to do it anyhow. This is the one that was just saying, I'll repent. I'm so happy to come back under your terms. He had just said that to God. And then he proved it wasn't true. <laughs> Sin is a terrible thing. We don't understand the deception of it. So the testimony of Jesus is all that can pull us out. Truth, unmixed with error. And I have to tell you, I have had to ask myself. Uh, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but... You know, I'm a human just like you are. With a need of the redemption of Jesus every day, every hour. Minute by minute. And I have, through my study and my experience and all these other things, I've been against the wall a few times, and I've had to ask myself certain questions. And I have wondered, can God really, really get this done in a human? Now, I know he doesn't lie. I know he can, and I know he's done certain things in my life. But the question is there. Can he do what he says he's going to do with us? And the answer, of course, is not this minute. That's the answer. Not this minute. But there's going to be a harvest when the full thing comes up. And that's our future. The harvest. God has promised. We're going to be there. Full bloom. Perfect in our character like Jesus. Isn't that what 1 John says? It says, when he comes, we shall see him, and we will be like him. <laughs> no, that's not maybe. That's the word of God telling us our future. We are going to be like him. Okay, there are many more quotations here I could get to, but I think we're going to say something for next time, too. By the way, there's no meeting next week. And the meeting after that's going to be at 4 o'clock on the 24th. Now, 4 o'clock. Okay. All right, I'm just getting started, but I better stop. <laughs> Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. He knows us. All about us. Did I miss your note? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Let me get to this note. They're even talking about Jesus knowing of the day of his coming or not. Many are saying only God knows, not Jesus. Many are saying he knows. So it is now this big theological debate. Well, let me try to settle the debate right now. <laughs> All the pioneers knew the answer. All of them. You can go back and read the early writings. 
The sentence in the Bible does not say that no one knows, not even the angels or the sun. That is not what the sentence says in the original language. And it is not what Jesus said. What Jesus said was, no one knows the day or the hour, and no one can make it known, not the angels nor the Son, but only the Father. Yes, no one can make it known. Jesus knows. I mean, that's ridiculous to think he doesn't know when he's coming back. But the father did not authorize him to tell anybody when it is. So he wouldn't do it. He didn't have authority from the father. Now, if you want some confirmation on that, by the way, all the pioneers taught that, and that's what Ellen White says too when she breaks the sentence down. But here's the way you can see it very quickly in early writings. On page 14, it says, There was a voice, there was an earthquake. And she says, the 144,000 knew the voice. They recognized it as God. And that voice told them the day and hour of Jesus coming. So there is a time when Jesus is going to have the authority to tell you the day and hour that he's coming. Yes. Yes. Let me tell you one other little thing on that page. I'm, I'm sorry. Can you get that to me quickly? Okay. There's something else hiding on that page that is not being taught the way Ellen White said it. She said, the living saints, 144,000 in number. Now, you're going to have to do some research to see who she was talking about. The living saints in Great Controversy, page 637. She says, every faithful Seventh-day Adventist, faithful to the third angel's message, will be raised. Well, who's that? Who's going to be raised? Well, Ellen White. She's going to be raised. James White, Loughborough, Haskell, all the pioneers, all the saints, and, and every Adventist who has died since 1844 is going to be raised by Jesus in a special resurrection, Daniel 12, 1 and 2. In that special resurrection, so when all the Seventh-day Adventists who have been dead are raised, and those who have never died are on the earth together, that means every Adventist is going to go to heaven is alive at the same time. And they are the living saints. On page 640, it says God delivers his covenant of peace and tells them the day and hour of his coming. That means every person who was dead as an Adventist and is now alive, here's the coming of Jesus Christ. And all the Seventh-day Adventists who are going to go to heaven are called the 144,000. Now, who is teaching that? <laughs> she says the same thing in Volume 1, page 67. She says the same thing in Testimonies to Ministers 332. She says the same thing in Acts of the Apostles, page 602. She says, I mean, <laughs> where have we been as a people? We're teaching things that are not true. And we're not teaching the things God said. What are you showing me here? <laughs> Behold? No. I got the wrong one. Jesus, when he cried again? No. 52? Oh, yeah, the resurrection. Okay. And he came out of the graves after his resurrection, right, and went into the holy city and appeared. Yes, there was a special group of people. No, that's a different group. They're in, they've been in heaven ever since Jesus was raised. That's different. Yeah. 
But I only mention this because we're not reading our books. We're reading words that somebody programmed our brain to look at and see a certain way. That's not reading the books. That's not listening to the voice of God. That's following the traditions of men. We're doing it in the Adventist church. Do you know that every time in our books there's bold print in front of something Ellen White wrote where it says righteousness by faith? She doesn't use those three words in what she said. Now that's a little strange, isn't it? That the white estate calls that section righteousness by faith, but Ellen White doesn't use those words at all. There's something that we need to be paying attention to, and it's not men. <laughs> Our books have been tampered in slight ways. What Ellen White wrote is beautiful, but when men start putting statements above and below and, and appendixes in early writings on that page 14, when you go home, you read early writings, page 14 and 15, at the bottom of the page, you're going to see a little asterisk. You go to the appendix to see what that means. Arthur White, when he reads Ellen White saying, we marched into the city in a perfect square. We, the living saints, we... He says in the appendix, that asterisk, that Ellen White often, when she was in vision, thought she was participating. Thought? Well, I'm sorry, Arthur White, but Ellen White is going to do exactly what she saw herself doing. <laughs> There's no thinking about it. God revealed to her her future. <laughs> So be careful where you're giving your loyalty. You give it to Jesus, and he will take you through all the maze of things men have done. Good men. Arthur Wyatt was a fine fellow. I talked to him personally. He knew a lot of things. He was very sharp, and he was sincere. But he did some things in our books that we need to forget about. Read the Spirit of Prophecy and forget about Arthur White. He's not a prophet. <laughs> he's not even the son of a prophet. He's a grandson of a prophet. <laughs> Special resurrection. Let me read it to you. I have the book here. Okay, we're over the time, so the tape should be off. Great